I would like to thank you all for coming out to this special occasion of the Chilmark Library's Summer Lecture Series, sponsored by the Friends of the Library. The topic is really special, near and dear to our heart here at the library. Uh, we have a, we feel a, a real special um, need to continue to preserve and share this unique part of Chilmark's history. The deaf community that once resided here it was important to the community and it's also important to the world because this was a place where everyone spoke sign language, where deafness was not perceived as a disability, where the hearing people were all bilingual, and they actually invented a language to communicate. Martha's Vineyard Sign Language, it predated American Sign Language, and many of the signs from Martha's Vineyard Sign Language went on to become incorporated into American Sign Language, along with some other sign languages um, from around the world. And so this is where part of the language was born, and we feel really, really committed to sharing that story as much as we can. So we want to thank our special guests tonight, and um, I also want to thank especially our adult program coordinator, Marlon Sigelman, who put this all together, did a fabulous job. Um, and so Marlon is now going to introduce our guests and get the program started. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So thank you so much for joining us tonight for a collaboration with the Martha's Vineyard Museum, a presentation on the history of the Chilmark deaf community and on Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. So I just want to ask that all questions be held till the end, and I'll begin by introducing all of our guests. From the Martha's Vineyard Museum, we have Bo Van Riper and Lindsay Lee. Bo Van Riper will present a talk entitled, The Chilmark Deaf Community, A 250-Year History. Historian and author A. Bowden Bo Van Riper is the research librarian at the Martha's Vineyard Museum and editor of MVM Quarterly. A third generation wash ashore, he first came to the island at the age of three months and became a permanent resident in 2011. He is the author, editor, and co-editor of 20 books, including Eggertown, which was published in 2018. Lindsay Lee will present film and audio vignettes from people of the island who remember and interacted with members of the deaf community. Lindsay Lee is the oral history curator at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. She has conducted oral history interviews with people of the vineyard for over 30 years. She is the author of four collections of oral histories and photo portraits, including the just released Vineyard Voices 3. Congratulations, Lindsay. <laughs> She curates a growing collection, now numbered at over 1,700 interviews at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. And finally, we are thrilled to welcome special guest, Joan Poole Nash. Joan Poole Nash will be presenting information about the history and structure of Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. Joan Caudill Poole Nash was born on Martha's Vineyard and raised in Chilmark. She learned Martha's Vineyard Sign Language from her great-grandmother, Emily Howland Poole. She learned American Sign Language at Camp Jabberwocky in Tisbury and at the Austin School for the Deaf in Brattleboro, Vermont. And she studied sign language linguistics at Boston University. She did the first data collection and study of Martha's Vineyard Sign Language in the late 1970s. Joan is currently an itinerant teacher for the deaf in Newton, Massachusetts. I would also like to thank Andy B and Wendy Watson, our ASL interpreters for the evening. Please join me in welcoming all of our guests tonight. Thank you, Marlon, for making this all happen, and thank you, everybody, for coming. This is an attempt to tell a 250-year complicated story in 15 minutes, so no pressure. And please forgive me whatever omissions or simplifications 
um, are involved in this. The thing to remember about the history of the Chilmark deaf community is how little we know about it, how little we really know about it, beginning with the exact details of how it began on the island. It's widely known that the first known hereditary deaf citizen of Martha's Vineyard was Jonathan Lambert, or Lumbert, who gave his name to Lambert's Cove, circled in yellow up there on that map, and who came from the Weld in Kent, England, sometime in the late 16 or the early 1700s. We know he was here by 1714 because Judge Samuel Sewell, on one of his visits to the island, mentions meeting somebody who can only have been Lumbert. And yet, what we don't know is whether Lumbert was truly the first, one of the first, or one of a sizable community of hereditary deaf who already existed on the island when Sewell put boot to sand in that day in 1714 and casually noticed that one of the party that met him, though evidently English, was saying nothing. We don't know for certain where many of the early deaf citizens of Chilmark lived, what they did, what they thought about the world around them or about being deaf in a world before the American Revolution when Martha's Vineyard in general and Chilmark in particular was even more remote from America than they are today. So I want to focus today on two broad things that we do know to be true about the Chilmark deaf community in the 18th century and about the Chilmark deaf community throughout its 250 year history as a cohesive group of people. One is isolation. These pictures were taken, most of them in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, but they captured Chilmark as it would have existed earlier in the 19th century or in the 18th century. A land of open space, treeless, grass cropped flat by sheep, split by stone walls made from the rocks plowed out of the ground by farmers trying to scrape a living from the glacial soil. Houses isolated from one another. A land where if you stood at your front door, your next nearest neighbor could easily be halfway or more to the horizon. A vast space with a small number of people. Knitted together by roads that would have ranged, especially in the 18th century, from bad to terrible. <laughs> Not only the roads within Chilmark, the progenitors of today's North Road, Middle Road, South Road, Menemsha Cross Road, the old King's Highway that's now nearly lost in the forest, but also the roads that ran down Island to Tisbury, what we now think of as West Tisbury Village, and Edgartown, 15 miles away and a day's round trip if you didn't tarry at whatever business you were doing in the county seat. All of this contributed to the isolation of Chilmark from the rest of the island, let alone in those days before Chilmark had a sheltered harbor. That didn't come until 1900 or so with the dredging of Menemsha Basin from the rest of the world. But with isolation came the need for community, because when your next nearest neighbor is halfway to the horizon, Community matters all the more. The ability to connect with your fellow human being matters all the more. This is one of those moments where I hit you over the head of how little we really know about all but the last generation of the Chilmark deaf community. When the Chilmarkers of the 18th century and the early 19th century, the Chilmarkers of Senate Jonathan Lombard's era on up to the 1850s, went to church, went to the general store, went to the town hall for town meeting. They went here to the place where Meeting House Road runs into Middle Road 
and where T Lane does its pasa do with the with the headwaters of the Tiasquam River. This, until the mid 19th century, was Chilmark Center. And really, haven't you always wondered why Meeting House Road is called Meeting House Road? So called because that was where once the Congregational Meeting House stood. Like the Congregational Meeting House in Tisbury, it folded in the mid 19th century. Its parishioners gone to be Baptists and Methodists. The Methodist Church was here as well. Two general stores, the town hall. Eventually, in the late 19th century, the town hall was moved to where we all know it stands today, as was the Methodist Church, not yet with its spire. In time, the remains of the general store and the congregational church and the old Methodist parsonage were taken apart and hauled away or fell into ruin. And with them, by the late 19th century, passed the physical world that the deaf community of the 18th century and the early 19th century had inhabited. Can we reasonably assume that in those churches, in that general store, in the town hall, they interacted with each other? As Lindsay's informants remember their descendants doing in the early 20th century, did the hearing members of the community sign the minister's sermons to the deaf members, and did the deaf members sign back agreeing or disagreeing with whatever the pastor was saying that day, sometimes nodding as they did, sometimes with a stern expression on their face if he strayed too far from theological orthodoxy? Did the men playing cards on the porch of the general store use sign language to signal one another about what they were going to bid unbeknownst to their out-of-town non-signing competitors? Did the citizens at town meeting interact as freely in sign language as they did in spoken English? We can presume so. It's unlikely to the extreme that such behavior suddenly materialized for the first time at the end of the 19th century and that what happened in this town hall when it was up in the midst of what's now the Middle Road Wilderness was fundamentally different than what the Wests and Coddles and whatnot of the early 20th century experienced there when it was at Beetlebum Corner. But the fact remains that we don't know. So much of what we presume to be true about town meetings, about church services here, the Methodist Church after it was moved, about what happened in schools is back constructed from memories of the early 20th century passed on by the informants when they were old and Lindsay's interviewees were young and then passed on to Lindsay and thus to posterity when the interviewees themselves were grown old. Nora Ellen Grochi remarked in the introduction to everyone here spoke sign language that within two years of the completion of her research, half of her informants had passed on. That is how close we came to knowing even less about the internal workings of the Chilmark deaf community that we know now. This phenomenon that I've been talking about, this need to reach out and connect with one another, to create community, even if it's only a community of a few dozen or a few score on the porch of the general store in the town meeting hall and the church sanctuary was by the middle of the 19th century being matched by another larger kind of community forming. By the mid 19th century, by the early 1850s, reliable steamship service was linking the vineyard to the mainland for the first time. By the end of the 19th century, 
there would be bigger, better steamers, there would be paved roads, there would be trains running from Woods Hole and New Bedford to Boston. But the process began in the mid-19th century with the ability to make it to the mainland and thus for deaf children from the island to go away to Hartford, to go away to what was then known as the American Asylum for the Deaf and Dumb, to be educated in a world beyond the one they'd grown up in. This played out in the ways that Joan will talk about later, in the blending of Martha's Vineyard Sign Language into other forms of sign language in a complex interplay that scholars are still trying to understand. But it also played out on the social level. If you go away to the big city, even if the big city is Hartford, your social circle expands. You meet people, as they used to say in New England back in the day, from away. And sometimes you fall in love with them. And sometimes you marry them and have children with them. And as Nora Brochi says in much more detail and with much more eloquence than I could in the time remaining to me, thus does the nature of genetic inheritance in the Chilmark deaf community fundamentally change and thus does the genetic basis of the Chilmark, of Chilmark's hereditary deafness begin to slowly recede to the norm for the general population. It works the other way too. The steamers that could bring Chilmark students to the American Asylum could also bring people from away to the vineyard. The most famous, of course, being Alexander Graham Bell who came in the 1880s attempting to understand why the deaf population in Chilmark was what it was. But also, outsiders who came for the summer, and the summer after that, and the summer after that, who came for the summer and liked it so much that they decided to stay. And those people, too, expanded the social circle of vineyarders, deaf and hearing, chill markers and otherwise. Those people too expanded the marriage pool. Those people too expanded the cultural horizons. Chillmark grew less isolated, never cosmopolitan, but by the turn of the 19th century into the 20th when this picture was taken at Beetle Bum Corner, more connected with the wider world. Paved roads, telegraphs, telephone, television followed. The dredging of Menemsha Creek and Menemsha Harbor opened up a maritime connection to New Bedford independent of the steamers and connected Chilmark even further to the world beyond the sound. Gradually, Chilmark became still isolated, still a place apart, still different, but no longer the place that the deaf community had grown and flourished in. It was, as the Coca-Cola and mobile gas signs on this Menemsha store in the, early, in the middle of the 20th century suggest, this picture actually would have been taken just about the time Katie West, the last native speaker, if you will, of the Chilmark Sign Language, passed away. Symbolically, at least, by the beginning of the great post-World War II tourist influx, Chilmark had lost its geographic isolation for all practical purposes. And although for native chill workers the need to congregate at the store, at the church, at the town hall remained, the isolation from the wider world that had allowed chill work sign language to form and that had allowed countless generations of chill workers deaf and hearing to grow up unaware that it wasn't normal to be bilingual in spoken and sign languages, to grow up unaware that it was remarkable to live in a world where everybody spoke sign language. 
that world by the middle of the 20th century, 250 years after Jonathan Lambert, or whoever came with him from Kent, had set foot in Lambert's Cove, had passed, and with it, except in memory, had passed the Chilmark Deaf community. If I can leave you with one thought, it would be this. Chilmarkers, deaf, hearing or otherwise, like most vineyarders before the 20th century, were overwhelmingly functionally but not extravagantly literate and thoughtful and deep and complex people but not introspective ones. Very few vineyarders of that year of any town left behind detailed records of their lives. The need to piece those lives together from bits and scraps and fragments and memories is not something restricted to the Chilmark deaf community. And there's something oddly satisfying about the fact that nobody from the Chilmark deaf community ever bothered to write down what it was like to be part of it. Why would they? To them, it was just how the world was. And if nothing else, frustrating as it is for us historians that they didn't, we can smile perhaps a little bit at the reason why. Thank you. I tend to let other people speak because I can never speak it, speak as eloquently as Bo does. So you'll be hearing some voices from people I've interviewed over the last 30 years. Um, to, just telling short vignettes about what they recall of the deaf community. So I'm going to begin with a piece of Eric Connell talking about um, his memories of, of the deaf community. And you'll see in each one, they all have sort of different facts. I mean, that's how memory works. Um, that there are, excuse me? You talk I'm, to the phone. I'm sorry, I have such a soft voice. Could I say what I said again, or could you hear it? You can hear it. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to play, uh, as I said, a piece of Eric Connell talking about the deaf community and what he remembers from his childhood. and is growing up and the signs he remembered. And then I said, you know, with each piece you'll hear, and they're just very short ones, um, everybody's memories of the facts are slightly different because that's how memory works. So, um, you know, I think everyone has their own subjective feeling of what went on and who they interacted with. So on my father's side, his grandparents were both deaf mutes. His mother wasn't very well after he was born, so he went to live with them. And of course they didn't speak, so everybody thought he was a deaf mute because he never spoke, because he didn't hear anybody speak. And somebody went there one day and said his name, and he turned his head and said, I believe he can hear. He didn't hear anybody talk. I guess he didn't think he was supposed to. I don't know. But then they see he was, he, no, he was deaf. But as I say, for a year or two, they thought he was because he didn't, didn't say anything. I don't know whether he didn't cry or what, but he didn't speak. He used to call them deaf and dumb. They weren't deaf and dumb. They just couldn't, they were just deaf, that's all, because they couldn't speak. So they, they all, afterwards, they call them deaf mutes. I think they call them hearing impaired now, don't they? Of course, there was a lot of people in town who was deaf mute, so everybody could talk with their hands. It, was, it wasn't hard, it wasn't easy because they couldn't spell. See, they never went to school, so they might know the first two, three letters, and you had to guess what the rest of them were. But in the conversation, you could you could pick it up, you know. So you could pretty, you could talk to people. Yeah, I could. You? Yeah, I could a little. It's been so long now that I forgot a lot of it, a lot of the signs. What signs do you remember? What signs do I remember? I remember snow, girl, lie, truth, 
shoe, dog. I remember quite a lot. They had a different language because it, I know uh, my father was down on the dock one day and this person come down and he was a deaf mute and he couldn't understand my father. They had different, they had different signs. Some, some were the same. Of course, they never went off the island, so they kind of instituted their own, you know. And they had a sign for most everybody, for the person. Now, if the fellow he lost his hand in the threshing machine when he was young, and he lost his hand, so that was, you knew that was Benny Mayo. That was Gregory Mayo's grand, great-grandfather. And Ernest Mayo, his was here because they used to hang May baskets. And he, the, they hung a May basket, and he run, he ran into somebody's clothesline, pretty near broke his neck, and they hit him right across there. So that was a sign for Ernest Mayo. When anybody went like that, you know, he was talking about Ernest. And some of the rest of them, a lot of them I can't remember now. For the fellow name of Josie West, and loved to play cards, so we'd go over to the, to the post office. This is where the Lombardi's is now. The uh, mail come in there, and we'd go in there, and he'd be there, loved to play cards. He was a good card player, too. Well, they have card parties to, to, to the town hall and the store. They played the store. Sometimes they'd have it to people's houses. They'd have, oh, three, four tables, you know. They were good card players because they could concentrate, you know, no distraction. But I remember all the signs. That was diamonds. That was clubs. That was hearts. That was spades. So our fellow and I went, he knew the signs and I did, so we cheat. We'd, we'd give each other signs. He knew I had heart, see. We were bad. <laughs> Before your time, there were more deaf people around Chelmark, weren't there? Yeah, I think there were. There wasn't too many when I was around. There's about, well, let's see, there's Josie West, and Eva Lork, Katie West. It was only about four or five. It was, I know before that there was a lot more that I don't, before, before I come around. Can you show us the alphabet? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, C. And can you count? <laughs> Six, seven, eight, nine, that's ten. Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, one hundred. One C, C is a hundred, see. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh dear. So all I ever want to do is go to fish in. I, I went with my father when I was, I guess I'm about nine or ten, lobster in, in the summer, some. And then I used to go with my uncle up in the pond dragging for flounders in the wintertime. That's all I ever wanted to do. Eric, and what a wonderful man he was. Um, and in that um, short film, he does it shows something about, you know, by the time it was the early 1900s, um, mid-1900s, uh, most people were using a sort of American Sign Language version of signing. And the vineyard sign language seemed, this is a generalization, but seemed mostly to be within the names and with the colloquialisms. So that, um, you know, every, everyone here had their name, and as I play a few more pieces, you'll you'll see more. But so I think you know, even by the um, would you agree with this? By the mid no, she doesn't. So okay, um, but by the I had felt and probably wrong because Joan is the expert um, that you know that the specific vineyard sign language was still. Um, maintained within the colloquialisms within the names. Now, Ethel Witten um, was, uh, she was a Blackwell, you know, from the Blackwell family here at Chilmark, who were some of Chilmark's first summer visitors. And, um, take play. 
and we had tucker parties as I was growing up. That was a lot of fun because the Methodists did not believe in dancing. So um, they would have a tucker party. What is a tucker party? And a tucker party, you had the, either the Victrola was on or they got somebody to play the piano. And you would walk around to music and the, they'd call out the changes. Face your partner, change your partner. And, but we do all the different things. And we'll walk instead of dance, you see. And one time I had a very chipper little man that I was walking arm in arm with and I was trying to be entertaining and talkative and I talked along and so on and he'd smile and nod and <laughs> never said anything and I said afterwards who was that that I was walking with it was uh, Benny West and he was completely deaf and down but uh, it was fun to go to church sometimes and watch uh, Ludie Mayhew translate the sermon to her husband on her fingers and he'd nod or shake his head or he'd smile or look cross depending on how the sermon struck him. Jared Mayhew was one of the founders of the bank and he lived up on the top of the highest hill in the neighborhood and he had a lot of land, a lot of cows. And Jared was a founder of the Vineyard Bank even though he was deaf and dumb. Yes, he, he was a very wise and smart man. And that was the first bank they had on the island, the Martha's Vineyard National Bank. You'll see in all of these um, pieces, or here in all these pieces, that people referred to people who were deaf, deaf, as the as deaf and dumb. It was not a pejorative term; it's just the term that they used. And as you see, how Eric is um, explaining that you know they weren't dumb; they just they couldn't hear, so um, so it's 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 the phrase that they use. Um, I made a few copies. These are just some um, oral history excerpts um, in text that I copied down one day, and they're here for you to take. If you want to give a donation to the museum, that would be great. But um, in uh, Ethel's piece, she then goes on to say, if I can find it. Um, uh, the, she and then the library first they had a little library in the store then they went to the town hall and finally they got to Katie's West, Katie West's house on the corner in Chilmark Katie West had been deaf and dumb and did the laundry and so forth for Aunt Florence and was very fond of Aunt Florence she was really on typo here. She was really on welfare with the town, and so the town had her house when she died, and Aunt Florence fixed it up for the library and has grown bigger since. Katie was deaf and dumb, but she went off to school, so she learned to say some words. She could talk, but mostly it was in this way, signing. Now, there's some incorrectnesses in that. I mean, Katie actually had been born hearing and, and became deaf. Um, so her, most of the, the words she could remember, she did go off, off to school, but were words that she could remember from when she was three or, or that old. The next people you will hear from are um, Mildred Huntington and Gail Huntington, who lived here in Chilmark. Um, Gail was a historian and, um, and a musician, and his wife, um, Mildred, worked at the bank. Um, worked at town hall and then she looked at the bank. But um, Gail was very, very um, instrumental, instrumental in collecting a lot of history about both, the, well, not in encouraging the collection of history about the deaf community history in general. Almost everybody in Chilmark could talk to the deaf mutes. I never was good at it. Thank God, Emily was good, and Gail got good, but I could get through it. It was just not natural for people to be able to talk to deaf mutes. They were part of the community and accepted by the community. So in the 30s, how many people in the deaf 
I don't think there were nearly as many as there were prior to that. There was Josie West, and there was our babysitter, Katie, Katie West. Those two were related somehow. And there was Eva Lork. Eva, I think she was related to some way or other. Henry, her husband, could hear and talk. Now, Josie West was the one that Thomas Hart Benton did a portrait of. Yes, and he married a Georgie Black who came from New Bedford and she could talk. They were accepted. There was no, no discrimination, no feeling that they were inferior in any way. Respected members of the community. I can remember going in the store and there would be these, I don't remember any women, men, sitting around this belly stove, talking over, you know, all that had happened during the day and the deaf and dumb people were there and there was all these motions with the hands going, you know, and they were just talking away. They used to go to church, and I don't think I know of any family where both the wife and the husband were deaf and dumb. I can't remember it. Almost one of them could speak, and the one that could speak would sit there and do all these signs with their hands and tell the person what the sermon was all about. So they got all the sermon. I don't remember any of them up there that used the sign language, strictly speaking letters and all that. But those who had been to school in Hartford, school for the deaf in Hartford in some hand, if there was enough money in the family, they could read and write. They didn't use the two-handed alphabet, they used the one-handed alphabet. But there were a good many who hadn't gone to Hartford and didn't have any education. But uh, a great deal of it was science. I don't remember a lot of the signs. I remember rain and snow and boats. A sign was a whole word. They had a sign for everybody. You know, they had a sign for me, and they had a sign for Gail. They had a sign for Emily. Emily's was this, because she had fallen down and put a spike through her cheek, which turned into a dimple effect. So that was Emily, you know, little and then this. But if someone went to New Bedford to go shopping, they'd make the sign for that person. Then they'd go like this. That meant they took the boat. And then they go like this. And that meant they'd been in New Bedford and they stunk of whale oil. <laughs> because, you know, whaling was still on. As you can see, everybody says something a little bit different about what they remember and how they interpret what they remember. So this is Sidney Harris, who had um, huge property on the North Road. His family did. His family owned the, um, the clay works, that property. I used to go to the store at noon time, and they'd, they'd be sitting there playing checkers. You wouldn't hear a sound there. Everybody was talking with their hands. People would come into the store, and they'd talk sign language. The uh, clerk would put the stuff in the bag, and they'd pay for it and go out and never say a word. They had all kinds of signs there. When a boat was coming in, they'd go out on the dock watching it come in, and, and everybody knew just how much fish they'd caught and what they caught and everything. And you'd wonder why they, they were making signs out there on the boat. They had all the information before they got ashore. After North school closed, I went to to a school up the Chilmark school. I was a disadvantage because I didn't know the deaf and dumb language. In the exams up there, everybody was giving information to everybody else and the teacher didn't know it. They were just giving sign language. I didn't know it. And uh, there was uh, a girl in school we went down to the fair and she she got hurt and her mother was was deaf and dumb and she wasn't deaf and dumb but when she when she cried she didn't make any noise she just <laughs> wrinkled up her face and tears come out of her eyes and in front of her mother but she she could talk but she never said anything because her mother couldn't hear what she was saying the last person we hear from is, I'm usurping your father. 
Um, Go right <laughs> um, Yes, and he's talking about what he remembers or doesn't, what he doesn't remember. And I think that's all how we feel about everything in the past. And of course, around here, we were used to sign language. And when I was a kid, there were a lot of people, not only who just used sign language, of course, talking to the deaf and dumb around here, but who used it amongst themselves just because it was simple. And it wouldn't be strange at all to see, I'd be fishing with my father, we'd pull up alongside of another boat. And in those days, we had these damned old noisy Lathrop engines, you couldn't hear yourself think, you know. And they'd pull up alongside and my father just talked to the guy with, with his fingers, you know. He, he didn't, uh, didn't bother to shout at all. Could you pretty much understand everything he said? No. No, I had no patience with it, you know. Another generation, it didn't make sense to me, why do that, you know. But he and his, the other fishermen yeah. had grown up using it right. all the time. Yeah, and thought nothing of it, you know. So when you were at the store, were there still a few deaf people that came in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the store, could pretty much everyone speak sign language? Yeah. You know, enough to get by with anyway. You know, when you're a little kid, you don't really pay too much attention to what's, you know, it was normal. I didn't think much about it, you know. All the once, it's historic, and I missed it, and I, I was right there. <laughs> So I think that's how, as I said, how we all feel about history. We wish we paid better attention. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm excited to hear what Joan has to say because she was really the first person to study the deaf in this in this community. So, um, a lot of our knowledge comes from her. that people often ask me is our, is sign language universal and I just wanted to show you in a really concrete way mm -hmm. that it's not. <laughs> um, this is this particular book um, analyzes 38 different sign languages from around the world but there are 250 known sign languages being used to this day so um, this book the first chapter is um, on American Sign Language, which is the most studied sign language in the world, because it's America. Um, and, um, but there's also an article um, about Martha's Vineyard Sign Language, which I wrote. <coughs> so um, we've had we have an overview of the history and how some of the data was collected. This all started for me when I was 19 at Boston University, and um, there was a small group of people who had started studying sign language as a language, since before it hadn't really been considered worthy of study because it was just gesture. And, um, and so all these older linguists are sitting around trying to figure out how we could figure out what were the old signs and how did signs develop and change over time. And, I would, and they presented a paper by Nancy Frischberg, who had discovered that um, older people sign the sign for cow, for example, like this, with two hands. But, young, but younger people sign the sign cow with one hand. And the same thing went for the following, horse, horse. <laughs> Oh, no, I can't think of any more animals. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> but um, we found that one-handed sign, two-handed signs tend to be turned into one-handed signs, and that signs that happened out of the periphery moved in towards the middle. So, for example, the old sign for health was this. Health, and then modern sign is this. So, um, so we continued to, so then I realized, wait, these signs look like the way my great-grandmother signed. I thought the signs that Emily Hallenpool was teaching me probably had something to do with the Boy Scouts, right? Because they had that 
Indian stuff, that, and she was always teaching me signs, and I, you know, I learned them. But they looked different from the ones that I was learning at Camp Jabberwocky, and different from the ones that I was learning at Austin School for the Deaf in Vermont. And um, I, uh, so I said, you know what? I know where we can find more of these signs. So we came down to the vineyard and we interviewed um, my great grandmother Emily Howland Poole, who knew a lot and a ton of history. Gail and um, and Mildred Huntington, who it, it's always interesting to see other people's interviews of someone because it's like. Word for word, that's exactly what she says on my tape. <laughs> um, and Eric, I, we didn't um, video Eric Cottle until many years later because I thought he was too young and wouldn't have remembered anything useful, like my father didn't really remember anything useful. <laughs> and, um, and, um, but he knew 300 signs. But it's interesting that he did them in the exact same order for you that he did for me in a to under totally different circumstances. <coughs> Anyway, um, so we knew that Martha's Vineyard Sign Language was, um, had some signs that were different from American Sign Language. And um, one, of the, one of the things that we learned was that there are different signs for fish um, in, in, um, in American Sign Language. The sign for swordfish. Look at the interpreter. Swordfish. <laughs> and on Martha's Vineyard, the sign for swordfish was this. If you were a person who actually just cooked the fish. If you were a person who was going out harpooning fish, the sign for swordfish was this. And these are show, this is showing the fins going out and coming back. With two hands, it's swordfish. With one hand, it's shark. And it was very important to know the difference between shark and swordfish, because swordfish was the fish that you wanted to get, and it would give you money or something to eat. And sharks, at that point, were considered worthless. Um, let's see. Let's skip through this. <coughs> All right, um, so I collected, in, in this first study, I collected 600 signs, no, I'm sorry, 300 signs. Um, later got up to 600, but, um, and I decided to look and see, you know, where did these signs come from, particularly the ones that were different from American Sign Language, and some of them very clearly were from French Sign Language. Um, the School for the Deaf in America was first started by um, a man, Lorraine Claire, along with Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. And, um, and they used French Sign Language because that was the sign language that, um, that Gallaudet had been able to get someone to teach him in Europe when he was trying to find out the secret of how to educate deaf children. So, um, so a lot of American Sign Language is based on French, is based on French Sign Language. Though, as, as with any language, it would break off into dialects and ends up being different from, from exactly how it's pronounced or signed in French. Um, so I was able, it was, Nancy Frischberg had done a whole bunch of studies on this already, so I didn't really have to do much except borrow her stuff. Um, but then when we were trying to look and see which ones maybe came from British Sign Language, um, which came from British Sign Language, and I was able to study that with, um, with a deaf informant from England, and um, we found that out of that out of the the first 300 signs that um, that I had in my data set, two, um, 40 percent of them were in British Sign Language and were not in American Sign Language. So. Um, So Martha's Vineyard Sign Language is, from the signs that we collected, is more has a similar set of hand shapes. Um, it was extremely. I, so it was hard to know for sure whether the the hand shapes were different because people were old and had arthritis, 
or whether they were just, or whether the signs actually were signed that way by the deaf people when they didn't have other factors going on. Um, so the first Martha's Vineyard Sign Language sample contained 11 handshakes. B and phi counted as the same handshake. C and phi counted as the same handshake. G, O, V, H, F, W, and X. So most of these were considered um, less marked handshakes not, that are very easy to perform than the kinds that children would not be able, that kinds of signs that children would be able to do easily. Um, but there are a few signs like the swordfish sign that are considered extremely complex because this handshake is a very late developing handshake and the movement pattern is, is complex. But um, my grandfather, Donald Lamar Poole, who we got a lot of signs from, used these handshakes very, um, very specifically to show the behavior of the fish in the water. So I'm just going to show you the signing here of a swordfish breaching and what happens to it. <laughs> okay, one of the things you look at when you look at languages is you look for minimal pairs, which are so that, and that gives you an idea of what various parameters are functioning in the language. So, um, so, for example, in English, a minimal pair is pin and pen. All that is different about those two words is something in the vowel. So, the same thing happens in sign language. In, um, and these are all examples from, from Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. This is the sign for sick. This is the sign for sorry. All right. This is the sign for swordfish. This is the sign for shark. The difference is one-handed versus two-handed. This is the sign for cow. This is the sign for devil. <laughs> also, as, as Gail Hunting pointed out, this is um, also the sign for cuckold. Do you know what that means? <laughs> <laughs> Does everyone know what it means? Yes. Okay, good. Because when I was 19, I didn't. <laughs> this is the sign for deaf. I'm sorry, I, I should really give you a chance to watch the sign in, in American Sign Language first and then see that. So, the sign for deaf. The sign for deaf in Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. Die, as in he died. <laughs> the sign for no, as in K-N-O-W. The sign for C, as to see something. The sign for milk. <laughs> and the sign for codfish. That would be spelled. <laughs> okay, here we go. There are two different signs for codfish. One is for people who cook the codfish. The other is for the people who fish for the codfish. So this is for the sign that people use at home. Codfish. And the sign that people use out of the water is calling in the lines. The sign for scallop. That would be spelled as well. Here we go. No. 
If you've ever been underwater with a mask on, it puts a pond, you are likely to see, see scallops that swim like this. Um, a sign for lobster. So, and this is the Martha's Vineyard sign for lobster. Which is a variant sometimes seen in American Sign Language, too. Um, the sign for thunder. That can also be used to indicate crab, this sign. In yes. Sign Probably indicate both the lightning and the sound of the thunder. And here it is in Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. <laughs> The sign for cold and same sign. <laughs> the sign for squid. <laughs> Very similar. Ah, okay, and here we get some really, oh, let's do these first. Clam? Clam would be spelled. Ah. Clam. The sign for oyster? <laughs> now, which kind of people invented this sign? The fisherman. Yeah. yeah. The fishmonger. Fishmonger, absolutely. Okay. This, now, here are some signs that are. Here are some signs that are unique to Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. The sign for horse. The sign for cranberry. Spell. <laughs> right. I consider it my mission in life for everyone to learn this sign. Cranberry. <laughs> if I don't know how many people that went when I was a small child, we went off with my grandmother just before Thanksgiving every year into the cranberry bugs, and this is how you pop them off into your bucket. Um, New Bedford. We saw we saw one version of that. Sign for New Bedford. It's indicated by the initials New Bedford and then B. Okay, and this is the sign. <laughs> <laughs> The sign for twins. <laughs> as Gail Huntington said, they're rolling around with each other in there. <laughs> and as the mother of twins, I can attest to that. <laughs> Merry Christmas. So this is to kiss, and this is a sign for Jesus. I'll do it really graphically so you'll see what it means. As in crucifixion. As in crucifixion, absolutely. So it's kind of an interesting sign for Christmas, but um, baby. The signs for spades, diamonds, hearts, and clubs, you already saw. Yeah. Um, and my only informant for those is Eric Cottle. So, um, day. Oh, 
for the opposite direction. Nay. Beautiful. And Gail Huntington had a beautiful little sentence that he signed for me. My wife is more beautiful than my daughter. <laughs> was not there. <laughs> okay, so um, so there were many signs that were unique to the vineyard because we have unique things, the fish, the cranberries. Um, other signs came from, came from the American School for the Deaf when people came back. So as you look at, at older, at younger people or people who had more contact with with the deaf with the deaf people, um, they used more signs that were that were that were modern, and um, and you, or signs where you could see that they had come from old from old American sign language and had been modified when they came back to the island. Um, there are special kinds of signs in sign language called classifiers, which are used to um, sort of as a pronoun system, where you make kind of are mixing a pronoun with a generally mixing a pronoun with a verb. So, for example, you could do the sign for car, and then take this a classifier that stands in for the shape of the car, and then you can make the car go up and down hills or go into trees or, you know, you can make two of them race each other. And all of, all of those were preserved in American, in Marcus Vineyard Sign Language. Um, fingerspelling, it's, it's very interesting because there were two different fingerspelling alphabets used on Marcus Vineyard. One was the British fingerspelling, which is two-handed, and one was the, the um, French Finger spelling, which is one-handed, and um, so Eric Cottle showed you the one-handed signs, and this is the two-handed. A B C D E. Now I'm not gonna be able to do it. G H. I'm really losing it today. Um, Q R S T U E W X Y Z. <laughs> um, so my great grandmother frequently finger spelled with the two handed alphabet, but almost everyone else just used the one handed alphabet, even though they Often you'd ask someone to sign the alphabet for you and they'd start signing it with one hand and then they'd forget a letter just like I did <laughs> um, and do it in the two-handed alphabet. Um, the other thing that, that Eric says is that, um, that the, the deaf people didn't know how to spell. They only used a few letters when they were signing words. In fact, what he was describing is something called loan signs where you know how there are some words in English. There are a lot of words in English that have come from other languages. For example, algebra comes from Arabic, right? Okay, so um, so when you borrow a sign from one language into another sign language, you change it to fit the parameters that work for your language. The way we see algebra doesn't sound like algebra when it's pronounced in Arabic. Um, so what and. We had several people who said to us that they never fingerspelled, and then during the context of our taping, we had very clear examples of them fingerspelling, <laughs> and um, and lots of things that that still to this day are used in um, in American Sign Language. For example, question words such as when. Um, can you show us the sign for when? Can you show me the loan sign for when? Yeah. 
they use the same W and E. The same person who led who led the lady on the walking dance with that the non dance walking. Yeah. Yeah. He knew my great grandmother, and when she was 13 years old, he came up to her one day and he said, "Are you married?" Oh. And she said, "No." And he said, "Then you're an old maid." Oh. <laughs> Do you have a sign for old maid? I would actually sign old woman, probably. Mm -hmm. This is what he signed. Mm -hmm. Old maid. Thank you very much.